Well, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this today. I've, I walked around a little bit ago and got to see everybody's table. Everything's decorated so beautifully. And I'm just so thankful that I got to come and bring my own daughters with me as well, Kelsey and Courtney. I have seven children and uh, four boys and three daughters. And the youngest didn't come because she just turned four, and I wasn't sure how she'd do sitting without me. So, but, um, but I'm so thankful for children. And with my daughters, I, I have to teach them many things as their mother. I have to teach them uh, many things to prepare them to be women and wives and mothers one day themselves. I teach them to cook and clean and um, do dishes. I teach them how to fix their hair, how to uh, dress appropriately, and take care of themselves. And, and the list goes on as a mother, right? If you're a mother, you have so many things to teach your children. Well, as Christian women in the church, we have a responsibility to teach those who are younger than us and younger in the faith. And it's a very similar uh, situation. Older, more spiritually mature women have a responsibility to pass on the things they have learned to the younger, newer Christians around them. And that goes with your theme, what Christian women must learn from aged Christian women. And uh, the, the word aged comes from the verse Titus 2, 3 through 4. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, that they teach the young women. And it goes on to, to give a list of different things they are to teach them. Aged isn't kind of a very um, nice word for us ladies, <laughs> but so I'll refer to it as mature. But uh, aged reminds me a little bit of cheese or something when I. Uh, but but the Bible does it does mean that those who are mature in the faith need to share what they have learned, and and the importance of this is because we're in a world that teaches the very opposite of Christian values and what a Christian woman should be. Our world around us does not give us the same principles that the Bible gives. It teaches the very opposite. And so today I want to look at some of that with you. We're going to look at the kind of woman the world teaches us to be, a woman of the world. I give you all a bookmark. Hopefully everyone got one. Um, and it gives a list of things that the woman of the world is like characteristics of her and then characteristics of a woman of the word and i hope today that we will all learn uh, that we are to become women of the word and to teach others how to become one as well so let's examine that first i'm going to uh, read from proverbs proverbs chapter 7. in proverbs 7 it talks about this woman this wicked woman of the world it calls her a strange woman and it, it gives a warning to young men and to men to not fall prey to her ways, not to be, become entrapped by her. Uh, so it is written to men, but in this passage, Proverbs 7, we find a warning to women to not be that kind of woman. So in Proverbs 7, we find the world's kind of woman. It says, and behold... Well, let me back up. There was a foolish young man who was out walking at night. And it says, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now she's without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. And the passage goes on to describe how this woman allures this young man and destroys his life. So these verses describe a woman of the world, and I want, I want you to notice the characteristics of what many women in our world, what um, they have, and what uh, one major philosophy that is taught to us women is feminism, and it affects us greatly, probably much more than we realize, even as Christian women, and that is uh, a great hindrance to us as women. I'm sure you've heard Pastor Waldrop speak about feminism before. I was uh, a student of his uh, at 
Pacific Baptist College, and I remember him speaking against the dangers of about the dangers of feminism, and um, and I remember how much he was against it, and rightly so. It, it is something that really destroys and breaks down our homes and our lives and our society and our churches, and we live in a society that praises this feminism that seeks to mold young women with that mindset. But feminism, I want to show you today, is like this woman in the passage. It's destructive and hurtful, like her, and it's wreaked so much damage in our homes, our churches. The feminist is a woman of the world, and she rec represents that. So I want you to notice in these words, we're going to pull out some of the words here in Proverbs 7, and you notice as I read them that it how it applies to feminism and how you see that that philosophy uh, it's it's not something new in our world it's as old as Eve and it pretends to be a fresh new idea but it's as old as Eve and it came ever since the curse in the garden so I want you to see how that's influence influences us so first of all in verse 7 it says she's stubborn she's stubborn that means she's rebellious it has this idea of jerking away the shoulder. Like when if you've ever put your hand on a child and gets mad a little toddler and jerks the shoulder away. It's that attitude of rebellion that's right here that this woman has. She's willful and headstrong. She doesn't want to be told what to do. She can't stand to be under authority, especially the authority of her husband. And you know, really, this is a rebellion against God because God has placed the husband in authority in the home. And we don't like to hear that sometimes as women, but it's true. That is the way that God has designed it. So this woman, she has a bitter attitude towards men. She hates to be led or guided. She hates to be reproved. She says, I don't need no man. No man's going to run my life. That's her attitude. So... That's her first quality. She's stubborn. Secondly, she's loud. It says she's loud. Loud means to rage, war, clamor, be in an uproar, to make noise, to roar. Does that remind you of any slogan? I am woman. Hear me roar. She says, I want my voice to be heard. I will not be ignored. She says whatever she wants, whenever she wants. And she uses her tongue to tear down and destroy, to hurt, to cause trouble. And you can see, too, her tongue is fueled by her attitude, by the emotions in her heart. It's fueled by the anger, the bitterness, frustration, even anxiety or fear that she has in her heart that comes out in the words that she speaks. She lashes out at others with her tongue and makes her voice be heard. And then verse 11 says, her feet abide not in her house. That means she resents or forsakes her home. She feels like her home confines her. And, she, and a woman of the world, you see this philosophy that they'd rather be anywhere but home. Rather have a career. Rather um, work in the workplace and have her freedom than be tied down with children and housework and a husband. And that is... That when we see that in our world, that is part of the feminist philosophy, our feminist world, and the same attitude that this woman in this passage has of Proverbs 7. Her feet abide not in her house. She does not want to be there. And then in verse 10, it says she is the attire of a harlot. That's a pretty strong uh, description there. She, that means she's sensually alluring. She dresses immodestly in a way that will allure and attract the attention of men around her. She uses her body to get what she wants. And she draws attention to her outward focus instead of uh, the, her inner character, because her inner character is not, it's not beautiful. So she's revealing that the wickedness in her heart by her body. And, and we see this in our world. We see how the world influences us and pushes us to bear our our skin and to reveal our bodies in a way that God would not have us. And then verse 10, it also says she's subtle of heart. 
this this phrase reminds me of in Genesis 3 1 when it talks about Satan how he was more subtle than any beast of the field and this has the idea that she schemes to get her own way she schemes that she uses others to get what she wants she does whatever she wants for her own fulfillment and if we read out this passage if we were to read out this chapter we would see that she this woman is outwardly religious she even she says to this young man that she's trying to tempt that she's paid her vows she's done the things she was supposed to do and um, but she uses those things even her religion to get what she wants to fulfill herself she's totally a self-consumed self-promoting woman it's all about me 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 and don't we see that today in the society around us we see women that are all focused on themselves we see all these characteristics love yourself and do what make do whatever makes you happy don't worry about others do what makes you happy so do you see yourself in any of those characteristics stubborn loud not wanting to be home dressing sensually full of yourself I hope you don't, but to be honest, we all do struggle with that. I know I struggle with many of those things, and we all do because it's, it's part of our sin nature, and then we also have the world around us that is pressuring us to conform to this thinking. But we are commanded not to con be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So what kind of woman does God want you to be? That's what we need to do. We need to look at scripture and examine that. And that's where the instruction of the mature godly women come in. Because you won't see the right example in the world. You won't see the example of the right kind of Christian woman that you need to be in the world around you. So we need to learn that from other women in the church who are mature and have grown in the faith and exhibit these characteristics. So let's look at the characteristics of the godly woman, the woman of the word. In 1 Peter 3, verse, verses 3 through 6, it says, Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair, and of wearing of gold, and of putting on apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Notice how that, I want you to notice how that is very opposite to the loud and stubborn, meek and quiet which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. In 1 in Peter 3, we find truths that older women have ta taught the younger women for centuries. They've taught them how to adorn themselves spiritually, how to behave as a Christian woman. So we're going to look at that, those qualities now. First, meek. This is the opposite of stubborn. Meek. It means a humbleness, a submissiveness to authority, and a gentleness. Meekness is not weakness as they say meekness takes a lot more strength than it does to be stubborn being stubborn is how we are naturally it's our natural reaction but to be meek takes a lot of spiritual strength to respond correctly when you're tempted to not to and we see that um, even people leaders in the bible many times were given the command to be meek we see that Moses was described as the meekest man in the world. And Christ himself, he said, I am meek and lowly in heart. Learn of me. He tells us to learn of him. So we need to learn this quality of meekness. It's not just for women. It's for all Christians. But as women, this is a beautiful quality if you see it in a woman. This is beautiful. It's lovely in the life of a Christian woman. So ask yourself, am I willing to be guided and corrected by my husband, by my pastor, by other people who, who want to speak truth in my life? 
Am I yielded to authority? And not just earthly authority, but am I yielded to God's authority? Am I allowing my will to be bent according to whatever God wants me to do? We can see that meekness in our relationship with God. If we're willing for our wills to be bent by what he wants. And then do you, do you lead and correct your children with gentleness? That's meekness. Even in leadership, we can see the meekness. Do we, do we respond sweetly and submissively to our husbands when he wants us to do something? So meekness is the first quality of the godly woman. And then quiet, a quiet spirit. This doesn't mean just not talking. In fact, uh, a godly woman, it says in Proverbs 31, she opens her mouth with wisdom and in her law, tongue is the law of kindness. So we do speak, but when we speak, we should speak with wisdom and with kindness. This woman, this godly woman who's quiet, this has primarily to do with her attitude. It means her heart is at peace. It's calm. Ask yourself if your heart is. Is your heart at peace? Is it calm? Is it quiet in the inside? She pr prays and rests in God's sovereignty rather than being filled with anxiety and fear. Her heart's filled with forgiveness, not anger and bitterness, and she's calm through the storms of life because she trusts God to carry her through. If you have that quietness, that quiet spirit in your heart, you will have a calmness and a peace, even during times that are so troubling to you. Even during health crisis and relationship problems and marital problems, you can have a quietness and a peace in your heart that will affect what you do and what you say. This woman does control her tongue because her heart is, under, is quiet and at peace. So her tongue is quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. She's a peaceable woman. She's easy to talk to without getting upset. So she's meek and she's quiet, very opposite of loud and stubborn. And God says those are the most beautiful adornment. He says it's of great value to him. Then number three, in, in contrast with the woman of the world who rejects and forsakes her home, this woman embraces and nurtures her home. This woman recognizes how important her home really is. I don't know if you realize it, but especially for those of you raising your children, your home is to be a lighthouse for God. It's to be a place where it shines for Christ and is a testimony to the world and a testimony to your children. Many children are affected by what goes on in the home and even in Christian homes, and they it affects whether or not they follow the Christian faith one day. So the home is very important. And she realizes, this woman realizes that she needs to make it a, her priority. To love and serve her husband, to support him, and to follow his direction. To love her children and take time for them. To even to keep her home clean, to be a good testimony. So make your home a priority. It's very, very important in the Christian life. Proverbs 31 says, The virtuous woman look, looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. And then number four, she is adorned with inner beauty. She's Instead of being sensually alluring, this woman has inner beauty that attracts people around her. First uh, Peter 3, the passage we're in says, whose outward adorning, let it not, I'm sorry, First Peter, First Timothy 2, I'm sorry, says that we should um, be adorned modest in modest apparel and with good works. So it's both of what you wear, but it's also how you act. It's the inner, inner character you have. And genuine godly character is worth so much more than outward beauty, it lasts. The world doesn't teach us this. It teaches us such an emphasis on how we look, and we tend to spend so much time on all of that rather than our working on our inner character and what God wants us to be. But a woman 
who truly loves the Lord and follows him, she will with time grow more and more beautiful. She may be beautiful on the outside, but whether or not she is, she's going to look beautiful to those around us, be, around her because of her inner beauty. And it, I would just want to say, too, it is important what we wear and on our outsides. It is important to be modest so that we don't cause men to stumble. And so, again, with the older women in your church, this is something you can learn from them. You can go to them and ask them, or ask your husband, ask someone you trust, is what I'm wearing pleasing to the Lord? Is it, is it modest and is it pleasing to him? Does it honor him? So this woman, she is adorned with inner beauty. She's inwardly beautiful. And then, last of all, she is full of faith. Rather than being full of self, she's full of trust in God. It says, for after this manner in old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves. You see that these qualities that they had were not because they just taught themselves and they worked really hard at it. It's because they knew God and they trusted in him. Has there been a time in your life when you have trusted God? when he's transformed you, changed your heart, and given you a new life. If there's not, you can't live like a godly woman unless God has given you a new life to become godly. And when it, the Bible says, all thi old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. That means our behavior, our actions, our attitudes, our goals, all of those are tr changed by true faith, true salvation, true trust in God. So a woman, a woman that follows the word, a woman of the word, is a woman who will show evidence that she's spending time in the word. She'll, her character will become more and more Christ-like, and her heart will seek to be pure. She'll seek to obey Christ. So we'll see these characteristics in her, that she is meek, that she's quiet, that she's peaceful, she loves her home, she loves serving others through her home, and her ugly heart has been changed into something beautiful for Christ. That's what we see in the godly woman. So which woman are you characterized by? Which one are you more influenced to be, the, the worldly feminist woman or the godly woman who's seeking to obey Christ? and follow the examples of godly women before them. The passage here in 1 Peter ends by saying, Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and not, are not afraid of any amazement, with any amazement. I'll just note here, notice that Sarah called her husband Lord. She, was, she called him her leader, her head, her authority. She was definitely, Sarah, the wife of Abraham, was definitely not a feminist. But, but we see Sarah, and it says, Whose daughters ye are, if ye do well. Not everyone has a mother who teaches them these things, these godly characteristics. I, I am thankful that I had a mother who was meek and quiet, a mother who loved our home. She gave her heart to our home. She made it her priority above work, above ministry. She made it her top priority. And she was and is genuinely beautiful, both inside and out. And I'm thankful for that. But not everyone has had that. And, and though you may not learn that from your mother, there are women you can learn that from. There are women in your church that you can learn those characteristics from that you never got a chance to. So look for those women. Look for the women in your church that you need to learn from. That you Look for women who are meek and quiet. Women who love their home. Women who are, have the inner beauty from the Lord inside them. And we can also look in the Word of God to find this. There's, there's so many of the holy women in the Word who we can be their daughters in a sense like Sarah, the wife of Abraham. So look for the, look for the Sarahs in, 
in the Word and look for the Sarahs in your church that uh, you can learn from. Ask them questions, model their example, and, and seek their counsel. Ask them to give you honest, true counsel from God's Word. Those of you who are the Sarahs, those of you who have known the Lord longer, you may not always feel like you are the Sarah that can teach the younger because we all continue to have to work on these qualities. But be sure to try to pass on what you have learned as a Christian woman. Pass it on to the younger generation of Christian ladies. They won't get the example from the world. And so they need you to teach them. They need you to model this and to live it out yourself. So may the Lord make us all daughters of Sarah, daughters who, who are meek and quiet, who are inwardly beautiful, and, and who love our homes and love the Lord with all of our hearts. Thank you.